everything we do in class is going to get posted on that website, including um, you know, the most common question that people ask me other than whether I should be in this class or not is, are you going to record the lectures on video? And uh, the answer is sort of. What I do is I run this program on my computer that captures what's on the screen, and it captures what's being heard by my computer microphone. So that sort of means I get a video of the lecture, but it's just a screen. You don't get to see my beautiful smiling face and you guys' beautiful smiling faces. And if I walk over here, you can't hear me as well. So like this part of the video, it's going to sound like I'm far away from the microphone. So it means like the quality of this video is crap, but I will give you these crap videos if you want them. I still think it's better to just come to class personally, but you do what you want to do. Um, before I get any further, I wanted to introduce one other person. Um, I'm not teaching this class by myself here. Uh, I am going to work with my brilliant and talented head TA. Her name's Amy. She's sitting in the front. I wanted to let her say hi real quick. Hey, Amy. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. Um, I majored in computer science, and now I'm working my master's in artificial intelligence. And at Stanford, I'm in testimony for products that he went to OJ yesterday. I was working black like everyone else. <laughs> What's cool about 106X in your opinion? Why do you like 106X? Um, you all ask really good questions. You probably don't know yet, but you will <laughs> ask really good questions. And yeah. So if you have any uh, questions or you need help with anything, feel free to email me or come to office hours. Bye, I exist. Goodbye. <laughs> She's the good cop. <laughs> you know, I'm the bad cop. She's the good cop. Um, Amy's not only very brilliant, but also also one of the nicer people in the, in the university. So if you need anything, she will help you. Um, in general, if you have questions related to the class, I think for now, the right thing to do is to send an email that's addressed to both of us, and then we'll both try to answer. That helps us split up the work. Um, later on, you're gonna get this section leader who works with you, and you'll also be able to ask questions of that person. By the way, do you like this? I didn't have a single picture of me with my beard, which I grew earlier this year, so I just grabbed a wedding photo. <laughs> I think I can fix it. I think I can fix it. Uh, hold on. Uh, uh, oh, wait. I can't draw on this? There. Okay, wait. Let me try. Uh, there. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much accurate. Now, yeah, anyway, email both of us if you have a question. It really helps because we get a lot of email at the start of the quarter, and so it really helps for us to spread the workload of questions. Bless you. So yeah, uh, a lot of people want to know what is this class, whether you should be in this class or not. Uh, let's talk about the three main introductory computer science courses. We have 106A, 106B, 106X. 106A is our first class. It's for a large audience. It's supposed to be a class that any Stanford student should be able to succeed in. We teach sort of basics of programming, variables, if statements, loops, arrays, methods, parameters, these kinds of things. Um, basic problem solving, drawing graphics. Great class, fun class, no prereqs at all. 106B basically follows 106A. It's more focused on processing data and algorithms, learning about collections that you can store data into, like vectors and lists and maps and sets and stacks and queues. You learn about recursion, algorithms. You learn about solving tricky problems, processing big files full of data. Um, you, you learn a language there called C++. So that's 106B. 106X is all of that, but just fucking hard. <laughs> and I almost never swear. So you can, I'm doing that for emphasis, you know? Um, X is the hard version of 106B. Uh, it's all the same content as B, but we might explore it a little deeper. We might uh, go a little farther with some of the topics. We might add a few little things here and there. But generally speaking, it's the same sort of content that's in 106B. I think there, there are some people who maybe have the wrong messaging about what 106X is. It's not a combination of 106A and B. It's not a combining of two classes into one. I hear, especially from some grad students, I hear like, well, I want to take both of these, but I only have one quarter free, so I'll take 106X. That's not really the rationale for taking 106X. You should take 106X because you hate yourself. <laughs> and you will grow to hate me as well. <clears throat> I mean, if you uh, have a little bit of coding experience and you want to build on that, 106B is a pretty good class for that. Its pace is more sane. 
106X is basically, you're going to have to do their homework plus other stuff that I throw in just because I'm in a bad mood. Your test will be harder, your curve will be tighter, you'll have more problems to solve, less time to solve them, and everyone involved in the course is belligerent and grumpy, it doesn't treat you nicely. If this sounds like the kind of experience that you're looking for, <laughs> you're in the right room. <laughs> I know you guys are a lot younger than me, but have you seen this movie? It's an ancient film called The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. There's a scene, yeah, a few people have seen it. Great, great. Um, it's kind of an indie thing, a little, bit, little known film. There's this, see, there's this guy named Luke in the movie. He goes to this planet called Dagobah, or system called Dagobah. He meets this guy named Yoda, and you know, Yoda's training him to fight these bad guys. And Yoda, you know, telling him all the bad stuff he's going to face. And Luke goes, well, I'm not afraid. And Yoda goes, you will be. <laughs> That's kind of the spirit of 106X. <clears throat> anyway, sorry, I'm kind of joking, but I'm kind of serious. Like, this is a harder class than B. There's nothing wrong with taking 106B. If you want to learn these kinds of concepts without getting your butt kicked, 106B is a great way to do that. We even worked it out so that 106B is offered at exactly the same time as this class. It's offered right now over in NVIDIA Auditorium. The instructor of 106B is Cynthia Lee, who does a great job, and she's nicer than I am, and she'll treat you really well, and she'll teach you really well. So, you know, if you start out taking X and it's going too fast for you, it's no problem to switch to B. It's fine. I'm just letting you know. But, like, I'm going to try my best to challenge you because that my sense is that that's why you signed up for this class, is that you, you have a significant amount of programming experience before this, high school or other classes or self-taught or you own a startup already or whatever, <laughs> and you've got a lot of that experience and you want to challenge. And so that's kind of the, what the, 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 the ethos of this class here, okay? If you're not sure whether this is the right class for you, uh, if you go to our website and you go to the um, FAQ section, frequently asked question section, the very first part of that page talks all about the different classes. We also have a handout. Let me show you these things. Um, there is a handout on our handouts area called which course is right for me? And so you can read in more detail. We also have this link in our page that says FAQ, and that page also talks about should I be in 106X? So if you want to email me and Amy to ask about that, that would be fine, but I would like it if you would look at these resources first and then email us your questions. Most of the questions we get are of the form, here's a lot of information about me, do you think I should be in the class or not? Um, a lot of times, I think the person could make a good guess for themselves if they looked at this, but we're happy to advise you on top of that if you, if you like, okay? So that's what I want to say about that. Do you have any questions at this moment about uh, these courses or the differences between them or any of that? Yes? Have you seen history and uh, preference being given to students who are taking 106X as opposed to be like applying for internships? Mm, is, is, is taking 106X like a, a, a badge that goes on your resume that might help you get an internship or a job or a boyfriend or girlfriend or something? <laughs> uh, not really. I mean, um, I think one of the beautiful things, one of the reasons I fell in love with computer science is that in large part people judge you on what you ha have done and what you can do. And if you can solve cool, tricky problems, and if you've built little, little apps or projects, and you've done neat things in your courses or on your free time, and you can talk about those with people or show them to people, people will want to talk to you and want to interview you and want to hire you, want to date you. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how I met my wife. That's all I can say. Um, so I, I would say you don't need to be here to impress somebody else. Uh, you know, this class is more about you wanting a sort of deeper, tougher experience because you would have been bored in 106B. It would have been too, too easy for you. And again, you can look at the 106B websites to help you figure that out. You can look at our website to help you figure that out if, if you want to look in more detail. But plenty of people, you know, 106X is not required or sort of secretly required to get into any secret cool clubs or anything like that. So any other questions about this? One thing that's not on the handout is we have these other classes offered this year. We have a class called 106AJ that's A, but it's in JavaScript. I'm not going to talk about it very much here because it's, I think if you're in this class, you probably are ahead of the, of the material of 106AJ. It's basically 106A level of difficulty, but in a different programming language. If you're curious, you can email us about that. Um, okay, so I'm going to keep moving. 
Um, we also have a class called 106L that's a lab. It's not offered this quarter, so I don't want to talk about it much today. Uh, it says taught every autumn and spring, but actually it's taught this winter and spring, so the slide is wrong. But since it isn't offered this quarter, <laughs> I'm not going to speak about it at much length. But if you want more C++ after this quarter, you could potentially take this 106L that's a lab exercise class for more practice. Um, okay, we have a book. It's called Programming Abstractions in C++. It's written by Eric Roberts, who's a professor at, here at Stanford. Um, do you need to buy the book? I know you want to know that because it costs a lot of money. Um, you don't have to buy it. You could certainly get an A-plus in the class without buying it. The main reason you might want to have it is that you're allowed to use it on your test, so you might want to look up some things in your test. But the test does not allow you to use other resources, like your notes, your printouts, your slides. So the book is kind of the main resource that you would potentially bring in. So you kind of have a leg up if you have a book, if you need to look up something. However, I bring some loaner books that I leave at the front of the room. So if you don't have a book, there's a way that you can look at a book. If you have an electronic copy, I won't let you use it because I don't want you to have computing devices out during the test. Do you have a question? I heard from someone that you're allowed a cheat sheet on exams. Is that true? The question was, can you have a cheat sheet, like a, a note sheet on the test? Uh, some instructors allow that. I'm not a nice instructor, so I don't allow that. Um, but look, I'll tell you what. Um, that probably sounds kind of mean. Why don't you let me bring my slides? Why don't you let me have a cheat sheet? Um, the reason is because I like to ask problems that are really similar to old exams. And I give you those old exams to look at. So you can study the heck out of them and get really ready. And if I let you bring a bunch of notes in, you're just going to bring the answers to all the old exams. And then the question I'm asking is too easy. And that's against the spirit of this class. I'm not going to try to surprise you and trick you. <laughs> On my test, I want to challenge you, but I don't want to surprise you. What the heck is this kind of problem? I've never seen this before. I don't like that. That's not cool. So I want to give you a ton of practice problems that are very similar to the ones you're really going to have to solve. But if you had all of them with you when you came in, you'd be too armed to do well, even if you weren't totally understanding the problem. So I let you bring the book because the book has a lot of syntax and stuff. And on the back page of the test, I give you my equivalent of a cheat sheet where I give you a lot of syntax that I think you might need. And hopefully between those resources and the shared books, everybody ends up OK. Um, that's, that's how I like to do my tests. I know not everybody likes that, but that's kind of the way I like to do it. Yes, question? So how many loaner books do you usually have? How many loaner books? There's like a half dozen of them. And they stay up here. So you come up and look, and then you go back. So yeah, if you went up and grabbed one, that would, they'd run out too fast. Yeah, so they stay up in the front. Yeah. So anyway, should you buy the book? Uh, you know, one thing I didn't mention was it is a good book. It is a good reference. So like during the course, it's nice to read through this and help you understand the material more. Um, but in terms of like, do you need it? Will you get a deduction or be unable to solve some homework or something without it? The answer is no. So I will let you decide if you want to look at it. There is a PDF of the book on the class website. So you can access the book without buying the book. But again, you cannot bring the PDF to the test. Yes? I don't suppose you could print out so like pages from the PDF. <laughs> can I print the PDF? You guys are really using those nuggets to try to figure out a way. Um, <laughs> Could, could I make a Braille version of it or something? Um, no, I don't want you to bring loose paper. And the problem is, if I, if I could really truly have a perfect policy, I would probably say you can bring these kinds of papers, but you can't bring those kinds of papers. But what ends up happening is if some papers are OK, it's really hard to like distinguish what kind of papers everybody has. So it's really the only way I can really have a policy that's enforceable is to just say, ah, no papers, or else ah, any paper is OK. And I've tried it the other way. If I let them bring everything, what ends up happening is I have a difficulty creep where I need to make the new test hard to solve, even if you have every old test. And so I don't like how that makes my test sort of creep up and up in difficulty. Uh, another question, yeah? Yeah, is this text the same as in 106B? Yes, same book as 106B, yeah. Other questions about this? There are some like older editions of this book floating around. Any edition will be fine. They haven't changed much over the years. There's even like a spiral bound edition that was sold at a copy center. That works fine. So if you see some used one of these, that's fine too. OK. There's also there's a few copies of it, I think, on loan at the engineering library if you want to check one out for a while. OK, so we have homework. Most of our grade comes from homework. There's going to be eight programming assignments. So you'll have about a week or a little more than a week each. Um, you will do some of the assignments by yourself, and some of them I will let you work with a partner, optionally. You never have to work with a par partner, but if you want to on some assignments, I will let you. Uh, the grading on your programs will be based on whether the program works properly when I run it, which is called the functionality, and whether it's written in a stylish, elegant way that solves the problem in a clean syntax. Um, those are you know, both significant parts of the grade. And once we grade you, 
we give you a sort of general score that goes into these buckets. This is the same kind of system that we use in 106A. Most people get one of these little buckets, either check minus, which means you had some problems with your solution, check, which means it was pretty good, and check plus, which means it was really good. It was everything that we were asking for, basically. There are a few other marks if it's really, really, really ridiculously good or really, really, really bad or you didn't submit it, but those end marks are rare. Um, you get your grade back by meeting with your section leader in person where they go over your, your program with you and talk about it. It's called interactive grading. Uh, question? Yeah? When you talk about style, um, is that not only the, like, how the code looks like on a page, but also like, the elegance of the solution itself? Yeah, I'll try to make really clear when we get closer to giving our first assignment, which will be Friday, I'll try to make it more clear kind of what I'm looking for. And just as I teach the material, I'll mention stylistic things that are important. But it's, it's everything from writing comments on your program to using good variable names to indenting well, all the way up to recognizing redundant code and capturing that some way so that you don't have to repeat the redundant code, coming up with an efficient algorithm that doesn't make the computer take too long to solve the problem, things like this. I will try really hard to make it so that the specs of the assignments tell you what I want. Maybe not like as a bullet list, but in the text of the document, I will try to mention everything I'm looking for so that you won't hopefully be too surprised by what you're graded on. But, you know, style tends to be a bit contentious because functionality is so objective. You run the program and it crashes or it functions or it prints the right answer or the wrong answer. It's pretty unambiguous. Style is more subjective. You might say, I like my code, and the grader might say, well, this, this thing should have been different or should have been better. And that, that can lead to disagreements, but I, I think what it comes down to is like, any setting where you're writing code in a real world setting, uh, you will have some kind of standard that you're asked to follow. Whether it's a coding convention, a coding style, a certain library that they want you to use. And you might have some input into those decisions, but ultimately you have to work with those choices. And whether those decisions are objectively right or simply insisted on by your workplace or whatever, it's important to follow a set of style guidelines. So we, we value that in our class here. Uh, yeah? Which bucket counts as full credit? Which one's full credit? Basically check plus is full credit. These things like plus or plus plus is almost like extra credit. You might get a small amount of extra points. On some of the assignment specs, we'll mention extension things you could do to potentially get extra points. But in general, we don't offer that much extra credit because I really want 100% to be enough. Like I think what happens in some classes is they have so much extra credit that you need 130% to keep up with everybody. And now you have to do all this extra work. And even though I'm a sadistic mofo, I don't like to make you do <laughs> even more than full credit to pass or whatever. So um, uh, there's another question, yeah. Is there any degree to which you can uh, get help from like other classmates, on, even on the individual assignments, like obviously not coded together, but ask, like, hey, how'd you solve this? Yeah, can you get help from classmates if you're stuck or whatever? I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I have a slide about like the honor code and what's allowed and what's not allowed and stuff. Um, in general, you can talk to people as long as you're not showing them your answer or telling them in great detail how you solve the problem. So if you want to talk conceptually, if you want to talk generally, hey, why don't you look at this example in the lecture? Why don't you look at that example in the book? Why don't you try this general type of a strategy? That kind of stuff is totally fine. Uh, you know, as long as you're not sharing basically your answer with each other or how you, all the steps of kind of how to do it, then it's okay. Um, yeah? Uh, if we choose to track our code in an SCM, are we expected to use a private repository? Ah, well, I have, yeah, I'll mention that also. Like, I, I don't want you to post your code in a public place, like on, on a public GitHub repository or a paste bin or something like this where Google will show your code. So, I mean, that's kind of my litmus test. If Google or Baidu or whatever search engine. <laughs> oh, yeah, motherfuckers, I know about Baidu. <laughs> I know about Baidu. I know there's some answers to my assignments on Baidu. I found them. I found them. <laughs> Watch out. If you're using Baidu, I know how to use Baidu. Uh, sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll take it down a notch. Um, <laughs> did I mention 106B is at the same time as this? <laughs> uh, sorry. So, so yeah, like some students put their work in a version control system or a file backup system. I'd like you to try to find a way to do that that won't put it onto a public access like Google or something like that. If you can, please. Um, okay. So anyway, that's homework and, and grading. Uh, oh, question. Yeah. Go ahead. Is there a style guide? Yeah, I mean, not only does every homework spec mention specific issues of emphasis on that assignment, but we also have a link here that says style guide on the top of the class webpage. And uh, if you look through that, it'll give some examples like don't do this, yes, do that, or whatever. So it, would, it might be good to skim over that a little bit before you do your homework, yeah. Okay. Um, so we have a policy called late days here. If you took 106A or B, it's the same policy. Um, 
you, uh, you, every assignment has a certain due date and time. You know, it's due Wednesday at 6 p.m. or whatever. And if you don't make it in by that time, the unit of lateness in this class is sort of one lecture. So from a Monday to a Wednesday, or from a Wednesday to a Friday, or from a Friday to the next Monday. That's like a unit of lateness. We call that a late day. If you have an assignment that you turn in late, in general, what happens is your grade goes down by one of these buckets. So if it would have gotten a check plus, we dock you to a check or something like that. But the first three such deductions are freebies. And so we call those free late days. And so I guess the idea is you could turn in three assignments up to a lecture late with no penalty throughout the course of the quarter. Or you can use two of them on the same assignment. So you could turn in one assignment two days late and another assignment one day late, day being lecture. Um, you can only use up to two late days on one assignment. So like if it's due Wednesday, you could turn it in up to here for one late day or over here for up to two late days. And after that, we just don't take it anymore. We give zeros after that. We don't have any, any acceptance of late work after that. Um, unless something truly tragic happens or whatever. But in general, no more after that. Uh, and um, you can mix and match, like if you have one late day left, but you turn it in two lectures late, we'll use your one late day, but dock you a bucket for the second one. And so like, you know, and the process for using these is automatic. You just turn in, and if it's late, we'll just use one of these for you. And, and if you don't use these, there's no benefit to saving them. They don't turn into extra credit points or anything. So you might as well just, you know, save them for the part of the quarter where things are busy and where you need extra time. Uh, what I like to say about this is that this is my uh, compassion portion of the course, where like if, if you contact me and you say, hey, I'm really sick, I've got a fever, I'm not feeling good, I, you know, can I please have an extension on my homework? What I would say to you is, I'm so sorry that you're sick. This sounds like a great time to use a late day. <laughs> Because these are not meant to be on top of the bumps and bruises of your life. These are meant to help you get over the bumps and bruises of your life. I accept your first three excuses of why you might not have your assignment done. Uh, I'm busy. My parents are visiting. I'm having a tough time. My significant other and I had a fight. I'm feeling sick. It's my sister's wedding. I want to fly out. Whatever. Like, all that stuff is awesome. Use these for that. So I would suggest try to save a little of them. Don't use all of them right away because you might need them for something that comes along later in the in the quarter, okay? But in general, like, beyond these, I don't, I don't give a lot of extra lateness uh, extensions. So if you say I'm out of late days and now I want to fly to my friend's bar mitzvah, I'm not going to probably extend your program for that, okay? So save a late day. Cool, any questions about this? How do you get your grade? Well, half of your grade comes from sort of daily, weekly things that you do, mostly homework. You get a little bit of points for going to your discussion section every week. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. Um, you don't have to ever come to lecture if you don't want to. I'd love to see you, but you don't have to come to earn grade points. You should go to your section to earn participation points. You're supposed to work on exercises there, solve problems. You do get points for showing up to those. Those are um, starting next week. You don't have to do that this week. You'll go to a smaller room with eight or 10 or 12 people and an undergraduate section leader who will um, work on problems with you. So you are graded on going to those. You don't have to go to every single one, but you have to go to most of them to get the full points. The rest of your points come from our two exams. The midterm exam, the date for that, it, the, both of the exam dates are on the class webpage um, and on this info handout that I didn't make copies of. Uh, <laughs> The midterm is on Thursday, November 2nd. That's Thursday of week six from 7 to 9 p.m. The final is on Monday of finals week from 8.30 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. I'd love it if you could all please write this down, put it in your online calendar, your schedule, whatever. Go double check your other classes, see if you have these times free. In general, Stanford policy doesn't let you take classes with conflicting finals. And we have, CS has almost exclusive license to this time slot. So you shouldn't have a conflict with this final. The midterm occasionally bumps into like physics exams or economics exams. If you have an exam conflict that's Stanford related, please contact me and we will figure it out. If you have an exam conflict that is not Stanford related, I generally don't give makeup tests for that. Your, your friend's wedding or whatever. Um, I don't usually give makeup exams unless it's a direct Stanford related conflict. I have mentioned that I'm not a very nice person, so that's one example of that. But if you have a Stanford conflict, please contact me, okay? So that's exams, grading. How do you actually map from this to a grade? I mostly fit you to a curve, but I do promise that if you get a 90% of the possible points, you'll get at least an A minus, 
And if you get an 80% of the points, I'll give you at least a B minus, you know, or better, you know. So I'm not going to, if everybody does really well, I'm not going to give somebody an F who has an 89% in the class or something like that, right? I'm not going to do that. So. <laughs> but I will say, it is a competitive group of people, and so the curve is probably going to be more in 106B than it is here. Like, if you're very concerned that you want to really make sure you get an A plus or whatever, you will have a better chance of getting an A plus than in B than you would here, just because of the nature of the two classes, right? Okay. Any grading questions? I know how important grades are, so I don't want to skimp over this. Okay. Oh, question in the back. Yeah, go ahead. How do you translate from your like, grading buckets to a number? How does the grading bucket turn into a percentage? That's a great question. Um, so I will admit, I'm not the creator of the grading bucket system. The grading bucket system is meant to give us slack at the end of the course for how we do that mapping, basically. So what happens is it's it's basically we look at how many people get check pluses, how many people get checks, and then at the very end of the quarter, we map what they mean based on that. And so a lot of people want to know, like, well, I got a check. Does that mean a B or an A minus or is it a C or what? What does that mean exactly? In a very rough sense, a check plus on a homework is kind of like an A, and a check is kind of like a B or a B plus. But it's fluid. If a lot of people get checks because the assignment is hard or a lot of people get check minuses, then maybe the check means something higher for that assignment. Do you know what I mean? So you can roughly map them out to being sort of A or B or something like that and check minus being like C, maybe. But that's, you know, we dynamically decide that at the end based on how everyone did. Yep? Can you clarify on that last bullet point about the slide? The last bullet point, oh yeah. Um, I typically make sure that about half the class gets an A, an A minus to A plus. And then about 30% of the class gets a B minus to B plus. Sometimes more. A 106X tends to get a little higher grades because you all have a lot of horsepower. You're all pretty, pretty strong students. Um, but basically, at least 80% of you are going to get A's and B's. Um, even though it's a hard class, I'm not going to like flunk half of you just because it's hard. You know, that's not that's not the kind of hard. I'd rather like bash you around for 10 weeks and then give you an A. You know, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe an A minus for some of you. I don't know, but. Uh, but yeah, like the, I'm not the guy who's going to like fight the grade inflation problem by giving everybody C's or something. That's not my stuff. So, okay. Yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, we are going to use some software to work on our programs in this class called Qt Creator. Most people call it Qt Creator, but it's, I think it's supposed to be pronounced Qt Creator. Um, it's a, a, a development environment for writing C++ programs. We're going to use the C++ language in this course. And uh, everybody should go set that up on your machines. I'm generally assuming you have a laptop or a computer or access to one. You should go install this software on your computer. Now, please, do me a big favor. I have written a web page of how to set this up. All you got to do is just follow what it says to do on the web page. A lot of students get set up where it doesn't work. And usually, if I go trace through their steps, they didn't do it. They didn't follow the instructions. They just Google for Qt Creator, and they find a link, and they follow that site. So go to the class webpage, and up here there's a link that says Qt Creator. So click on that. These links look kind of, it looks kind of weird because of my small resolution, but uh, you click on the thing that says Qt Creator, and then it asks you what operating system you have, Windows, Mac, Linux, you click that, and it says, okay, go here, download this, install it, go here, download this. I've got some screenshots for you. So just like do what it says, it, and it should be fine. <laughs> um, a great thing for you guys to go do, if you want something to go work on after today's lecture, go try to set up this Qt Creator software on your machine. If you can get a simple program to run and print one line of output, that's awesome, that's great. Because I get a lot of people who are, it's the day before homework one is due, and they're like, help, my, my computer doesn't work with Qt Creator, and it's like, well that sounds like a you problem. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, go try to set it up. If, if for some reason it doesn't set up properly on your machine, Amy and I would love to help you. But the more time you give us to do that, the more likely you'll have plenty of time to work on your assignment. So go do that today or tomorrow or whatever. Follow our instructions. A lot of students want to ask us, like, can I use some other software? Like, I like Xcode or whatever. I mean, short answer, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I can't stop you, like, if you know some other program that you want to use, I can't, like, go to your dorm and hold your hand so you can.